of you don't know me, probably up 10 months. This is my beautiful wife here, Sheila Stan. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be at the pulpit, representing the love of God. Let's pray. Father, without you, we are. I don't need to be heard today. But we want to hear from you today. That's our heart's desire. We want to live, we want to leave here today with more than we came with. Because of your presence with us, your word. So speak to us. Minister to our hearts with your loving kindness and your mercy and your grace. We are grateful. Thank you for Pastor Kim and his heart and his laid down life and for this precious body that you have brought together. Thank you, Father. We love you. Praise you. I'm here today to just share some simple life-changing truth. It won't be anything out of this world, but it'll be out of this world. I'm not going to be here to, to give you a lot of Greek, a lot of Hebrew, but I just want you to hear the heart of God today. And the heart of God will break the anointing, will break the yoke, and will speak to our hearts. And our lives will be changed I often say that if your pastor is not pointing you to Jesus, you need to find another pastor. Because it's all Jesus. It's all the finished work of Calvary. That is our life. That is our love. That is our beginning and that is our end. If I titled my message today, it would be this. He who knows me perfectly loves me perfectly. Think about it. I don't know you, and you don't know me. We can all come to church and we can have our Sunday morning face on. But nobody knows what our Monday morning face is. Except Jesus. And even with that face, and even that He knows me perfectly, He loves me perfectly just the way I am. And that's the love. You see, many times people believe in the unconditional love of God. And they love it. We fall in love with it. We're all guilty. Even believers. We think that when we fail, that God's love leaves us. Or that God's love changes toward us. And I'm here to tell you today, folks, just because you change don't mean God's love changes. His love is everlasting. It's unchangeable. And there's nothing that you can do to make Him love you more. And there's nothing that you can do to make Him love you less. Because in 1 John 1, and I'm sorry, 1 John 4, verse 10, it says, Herein is love. I shared it last time I was here. Herein is love. Not that you love me, but that I love you. You see, my friends, He loves you because He loves you. Because He loves you. Because He loves you. Because He loves you. There's nothing you can do to earn this love. There's nothing you can do to merit this love. There's nothing you can do to stop this love. Because this love of God to you is not from you. It's not for something you did or did not do. It's because He loves you. Because He loves you. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ constraineth us. You see, his whole life was constrained by love. And, and what it means here is that the love of Christ controls us. And it compels us. And it urges us with an irresistible power. With a power that is 
that can produce an effect. I don't know how much you know about Paul's life, but he called himself the chiefest of sinners. If we think about Paul and his life, he was a proud, educated Jew. He hated Jesus because of the changes that were coming about because of the love of Jesus. He hated Christians. And he gained permission to go out and seek and kill Christians. He said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. But then one day, God sought him out. You see, Paul did not seek God. God saw Paul out. And it changed his life. And he said that the love of God had a power that was sufficient to produce an effect in his life. And we have that same power today. That same love constrains our hearts. We find that we can love when we could not love before. We find that we have an effect on people's lives when we, when we never had an effect on anyone's life before. Because of the love of God constraining us. You see, it has nothing to do with you. We are just recipients of this great. So no matter where you're at in your life, no matter what you've done or have not done, God loves you right where you are. And He wants to minister to you right where you are. The Word of God says in the book of John that He must increase and we must decrease. And you know what that's all about? It's just about Him increasing. Because the more He increases in our lives, we realize that we have to do nothing except receive what He has already done for us. And as we receive for what He has already done for us, our life is not important anymore. What's important is that we are just recipients. We just receive continually His great grace, His great mercy, His loving kindness. And by receiving this, then we learn how to rest in Jesus. And you know what happens? We are changed from the inside. You see, I don't have to be concerned about the outside. I don't have to be concerned as to whether He's going to receive me or not or allow me or not or disqualify me because I've been qualified by the cross of, of Calvary. I've been qualified by the blood of Jesus. Yes. You see, and now I just rest in what He has already done. And as I rest in what He has already done, my life is changing from the inside out. I'm not having to do anything except receive rest of what He's already done. And that's what makes the difference in our lives. So I say to you, brothers and sisters, just receive what Jesus has already done. Just rest in what He has done at Calvary. And watch the changes take place in your life without effort. Because the constraining love of God that controls my life. I'm not in control. He is. I'm not having to do anything He does. I'm not striving or struggling. I'm just resting. And that's where Jesus wants us today. He says, yes, in Jeremiah 31, 3, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I am drawn. If the love of God is not drawing you, then you're not being drawn. If you're, in, if you're hearing a message that's not drawing you because of love, you're not hearing the message. Because it's all about God's love. It's not do good, get good. It's not do bad, get bad. You see, my friends, it's receiving the love of God that will fill the emptiness in your soul. The only reasons that we're drawn to sin or to wrongdoing is because we're trying to fulfill something in our hearts. But as we allow the Word of God and the love of God to fulfill our hearts, then we no longer have these desires for sin. That's the difference. But we're still flesh. And we're still blood. You see, and there will still be times of temptation. But you know what? You just rest in God's love for you. Because these times does not change God. These times does not change the love of God. about just receiving what Christ has done for you. Let the change take place in your hearts. His love is not based upon who you are. 
not based upon what you've done or what you have not done. And there's nothing you can do about it. I like to say to folks, you know what? God loves you. God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make Him love you more. You can't make Him love you less. Because His love is based upon who He is and what He has done for you. Not who you are. Isn't that wonderful? Now let me ask you a quick question. Does that just want to make you run out of this door and go sin? You know, because people say, well, you give people a license to sin with that message. I'm telling you that I give people an opportunity to live right because their soul has been set free and they don't have to worry about right and wrong. You see, it's not a license to sin. It's a license to love. It's a license to receive the love of God. That's what this message is all about. In Romans 8, 38, 39, we talked about God's love being unconditional. Paul said, For I am persuaded, I'm convinced, and I continue to be convinced, he says, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor, nor threatening, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the unlimited love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing! You know what nothing means? It means nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Just, just, just breathe it in. Just breathe that in. Nothing will ever separate you from the love of God. There's nothing you can do. God will always love going to talk about it in a moment, but His justice has been satisfied right here on the cross. That's God's love for us. You know, as we're filled with that love, it overflows. I was in the wild by the other day, just getting a cup of coffee, and, and, and you make a mistake when you ask me how I'm doing. Because <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you know. And, and the young man said, how are you doing today? And I said, you know what, sir, I'm just receiving. And he said, what do you mean? I said, I'm just receiving the blessings that God has for me today. I'm just receiving the unconditional love that God has for me today. And you know what happens? People start listening. Because how many times would you ask somebody how they're doing today, they would tell you that. You see what I mean? It just overflows in our souls, don't it? This, this love and this joy, and it's not something that I create or you create. It's something that's created by the one who knows us best and loves us best, who knows us perfectly and loves us perfectly. And we just receive that love. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. i got to put my glasses on because I want to read you something that's polar writing in mind. How many ever heard the Message Bible? This is from the Message Bible. It's quite interesting uh, how he states it. Sorry, that's the wrong page. Let's go to this page. He said, The one who died for us and who was raised to life for us is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. Do you think anyone's going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There's no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in the scriptures. None of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I am absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say, my friend, is wow. The love of God constrains our hearts. It makes a difference. It puts us into the control of Jesus, not in the control of ourselves. We don't even know that it's happening. It's just the life that He gives us that makes a difference in our own lives and in the lives of others without us even trying. All we have to do is receive this great love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Another 
story I wanted to share with you is that uh, there was a minister in Oregon who was, a, who was assigned to counsel, to counsel in a state uh, mental institution. And as he got there, the first thing he was assigned to was a padded cell that housed deranged, barely clothed patients. He couldn't even talk to the inmates, let alone counsel. The only response that he would get was groans and moans in the demonic laughter. Then the Holy Spirit prompted him to sit in the middle of the room and for a full hour just sing the famous children's hymn, Jesus Loves Me. This I know. What the Bible tells me. And little ones to him belong. They are weak. Nothing happened at the end of the first day. But for weeks, he persisted to sing the same melody with a greater conviction each time. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. And as the days passed, the patients began singing with him one by one. And amazingly, by the end of the first month, 36 of the severely ill patients were transferred from the high dependency ward to a self-care ward. And within a year, all but two were discharged from the mental institution. God's love makes a difference. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're going through. But I do know this. That if you receive the God's love unconditionally, it will make a difference. You know, the things that Satan tries to do is to condemn us. He tries to make us feel shameful. He makes us try to be afraid. You see, he wants you to be sin conscious. Because when you're sin conscious, you're not God conscious. But the Holy Spirit desires that we be God conscious. You see, he wants us to be Conscious of His great love. Conscious of His mercies that are new every morning. Did you know that every morning you have a fresh step to start with God? The Bible says in Lamentations 3 that every morning the mercies are brand new. Every morning. What are the mercies that are brand new? The mercies that are brand new is that every morning He takes away that which you deserve because of bad decisions. He takes away that which you deserve because of bad thoughts. He takes away that which you deserve because of bad habits. And He gives you grace. And what is grace? We all know what grace is. It's the divine favor of giving us something we don't deserve. Something that we can't earn. So the Bible says in Lamentations 3 and verse 20 that every morning the mercies are granted. His compassions fell not. And great is thy faithfulness. Not my faithfulness, but his faithfulness. This is the God that we have. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that we receive from. It's not the God of tribulation. Because the tribulation was taken care of on Calvary if you just received that gift of love. You see, it's the God of kindness. It's the God of loving kindness. This is the God that we serve. I'm not up here with a stick in my hand to whack you over the head because you made a bad decision. No, I'm here to draw you with my loving kindness. That's what I'm here for, Jesus says. Isn't that awesome? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing to fall in love with the one who loves you. He who knows me best loves me most. Think about it. He who loves me best. He who knows me best loves me most. You know, my wife loves me unconditionally. And there's things in my life that she don't know. There's things in her life that I don't know about her. But you know what? It don't matter. We love each other. But God who knows all things loves me most. He knows my weakness. He knows your weakness. 
this. If you receive Christ as your Savior, He don't know your past because you have the past. Did you hear what I said? He don't know your past because you don't have a past. Because your sins have been washed away through the blood of Jesus. The Bible says that they've been blotted out if I blot something out on my paper today, you will not be able to read it because you'll never know that it was ever there with it blotted out. It would look like this. You see what I'm saying? That's the way your sins are with God today. And He don't even want you to remember the sin. He wants you to be righteousness conscious. We are the righteousness of God. There was a great exchange that took place. And that great exchange was He who knew no sin became sin for us that we may become the righteousness of God. I like to call that the great exchange. He took my place and I have taken His place. I am the righteousness of God. Where do you see that? Where do you see that at, Tim? I see that in uh, Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. And this is what it says. It says, through the abundance of grace, more grace than I'll ever need, through the abundance of grace, in the gift of righteousness. I've been given a gift. You've been given a gift. The gift of righteousness. We shall reign in this life. Not in the sweet by and by. But we shall reign in this life. Through one, Jesus Christ. I preached a message a, a, a few weeks ago. This is what I, I asked the audience. Have I done anything yet? Have I done anything yet to earn my salvation? Have I done anything yet to earn my keep? No. I'm just receiving the love of God. I'm just receiving what Christ has for me. I'm just walking in the righteousness of God that He has made me to be because He was a gift. I've done nothing. And then I said to them, if I do something, please call me out. Because when I do something, it's no longer grace. How many times... Have you felt like the Lord can't bless you because you just failed in your life or you just made a mistake? Or maybe you even did it on purpose. You got caught in a weak moment. And you thought to yourself, God can't bless me. I'm here to share with you, my friends. God's blessing is not dependent upon who you are. It's dependent upon who He is and what He has done in you. He who knew no sin became sin that we may become the righteousness of God. The Bible said he knew no sin. The Bible says he was no sin. But then the Bible says he became sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of God. This is our God. This is his love. And we're very grateful and thankful. But God's not looking at you after your failures or your sins. You see, we look unto Jesus. I don't look at you. I look unto Jesus. I look unto Jesus and I see you. You don't look at me, you look unto Jesus. You see, the Bible says that looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. That's in Hebrews 12 too. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The Amplified says it this way, looking away from all that will distract us and focus in our eyes on Jesus who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. You see, once again, the devil wants us to get to look at ourselves because when we look at ourselves, we'll find weakness. We'll find failure. And that's where the devil wants us to focus. But the Word of God says, looking unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher. The New American Standard, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. I want to share one more thought with you because I'm running out of time. I want you to see this carefully. Galatians 2.20, many of us are familiar with this verse. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I even live, yet not I, but is Christ that lives in me. And he says, in the life which I live, I now live in the flesh. This life, the one we're living in the flesh, he said, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and 
gave himself for me. You know what, friends? I'm not even living by my faith. Because my faith will have times of weakness. My faith will have times of doubt. My faith will have times of questions. Paul said, I'm living by his faith. And how can we live by his faith? Because we have become a part of who he is. We have become a part of the eternal one. And we can see that many times. And Pastor Phil shared it this morning. That we have been given eternal life. And a lot of us would think, that, well, that just means we're going to live forever. No, that means that we have been given the life of the eternal one, God himself. We have his life. We share his life. He lives in us. And we live by his faith. The pressure's off of us. We don't have to impress God. We just receive the one who God sent to bring his justice to and I can say a lot more, but I'm not going to. This is what I want to leave you with, though. This is beautiful. See, i got many pages to see here. I just want you to share this with you in closing. He said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And I just want to share a few things that when you look unto Jesus, what do we see? We see the one who is the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. The beginning and the end. And the author. And the finisher of our faith. The one who created the universe. And he holds it all together. We see the one who always was. Always is. And always will be. I see the one who is unmoved. He's unchanging. He's undefeated. And he's never outdone. He was bruised that I might be healed. He was pierced that he might ease my pain. He died to give me life. His life. He fought the battle against darkness to bring me peace. He is light. He is love. He is Lord. He is goodness. And he is kind. He is gentleness, and He is God. He is holy. He is righteous, mighty, powerful. His ways are right. His word is true. He is unchanging, and He thinks of me and you. He's my Redeemer. He's my Savior. He's my guide. He's my peace. He's my joy. He's my comfort and my hope. I serve Him because He loves me. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. He gives me life and life more abundantly. He is all-powerful. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He'll never mislead me. And He'll never forget me. When I fail, He picks me up. And when I fail, He forgives me. And when I'm lost, He shows me the way. And when I'm afraid, He stands by my side. And when I'm hurt, He heals me. And when I'm broken, He mends me. And when I'm confused, He leads me. And when I have a problem, He solves them. May we always be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Psalms 27, 13, David said, I would have despaired had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the have we seen the goodness of the Lord today? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love, Lord, that is unconditional. And that we're the only ones that can, can place the condition for Free us from placing conditions upon you. Maybe you're here today and you've never heard of this great love of God. Maybe you're here today and you didn't realize that no matter what, 
has occurred in your life that God loves you. And that He died and He took your place on the cross for sin. He who, knows, he, he who knew no sin became sin for you. That today you can become the righteous of God. If you would like to receive Christ as your Savior today, it's a simple belief. Lord Jesus, I know I can't help myself and I need your help. And I call upon you, Father, to come into my heart and life and live. And I believe that your blood has cleansed me and made me whole. If you want to say that today, raise your hand if you want to receive Jesus Christ in your heart. Nobody is looking for just say a prayer for you. Maybe today you have someone in your heart that you want us to pray for. Just lift your hands and we'll pray together. Lord Jesus, you see the hands of those who have deep requests in their hearts for someone. Maybe themselves, maybe someone else. We ask you, Lord, to minister. Make yourself known through the precious blood of Jesus. Make yourself known through your great love and kindness. Touch and heal. Bless this church, Father. We just pray that these uh, doors would burst wide open with your love. As they burst wide open with your love, Lord, we know that every pew will be filled. Every seat would be taken. And thank you, Father, that they're lifting up the name of Jesus. And you are glorified and magnified. And what a great body. We pray for Pastor Kim today that you would continue to heal and touch and strengthen. We pray for our friends in Costa Rica who are listening right now, Lord, that you would bless the church in Costa Rica. Bless Pastor Brent. Give him your heart and your wisdom. Just bless the body of Christ there, each one. We love them so special. Pray that you bless their day as well. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray. Amen.